Today I'm going to start a series of three sermons on the same uh, passages, so bear with me. In 1 Peter 3, 17 through 22, it says, For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once, get that once, for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we look at these passages in the next couple of weeks, we just ask you, Lord, to uh, we understand them and take them into our hearts and to lift us up. And this message today, dear Heavenly Father, certainly should lift us up because it's all about Jesus Christ who has come and died for us and given us new life. And we just thank you for that, dear Heavenly Father, because you're such a gracious uh, God who has created us, has saved us, and now has a place for us in heaven forever. We just give you the glory in all things, and thank you for our forgiveness. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Well, we've talked about submission in the past few messages. Jesus also submitted and suffered a horrible death. And death from that we now receive our salvation. We are to stand firm even if the world brings slander against us. In the 16th chapter of Acts, we read of the imprisonment of Paul and Silas in Philippi. They were not discouraged because of the phony charges that placed them behind bars. The record declares that about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. The prisoners listened. Suddenly, there was an earthquake that shook the buildings and loosened its doors. The opening of the doors awakened the keeper of the prison, who drew his sword to take his life. When Paul cried out, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and with fear fell down before these missionaries asking, Men, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. That's in the 16th chapter of Acts if you want to read about that story. But even during horrific problems in our lives, and as we see, Paul and Silas were in prison, they were in chains, and they were singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs in prison. And everybody was listening to those glorious songs and realizing that there was something special about Paul and Silas, that they were getting the message of Jesus Christ. So even during horrific problems in our lives, Our lives must point others to the understanding that our part is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You are to point people to Jesus by your life. So the horrible pain that we might be going through either physically or spiritually can be the catalyst for someone to see your endurance and to wonder why. They will ask you, because of it. The reason for your hope is in Christ. I must to say about this passage that I must make it a three part sub point passage. The first point in this um, set of messages is today one, the reason we are saved. Two is the victory announcement. And three, the reason for baptism. 
Well, I hope you will not miss any of these three, but I do know you're not going to miss the first one because you're here today. <laughs> and I'm going to let you have it from the time I start until the time I finish. You may not always agree during this time about what I have to say, but I'll guarantee you there's one thing we can always all agree upon is that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that we have everlasting life through the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Let's give him all the glory. So the first thing today I'm going to talk about is he was put to death, but he was made alive by the Spirit. This is the heart of the gospel. And the gospel is the power unto God or of God unto salvation for those that believe. It says first for the Jew and then the Gentile. It is by faith from first until last. It is by faith that we are saved from beginning to end. And we must give God all the glory. He was put to death only once. Only once does he need to be put to death. And he did it to continue to sacrifice our sins through the blood that he gave that day on Calvary. He died, was buried, and he rose again to the glory of our Father in heaven and for our salvation. Hallelujah. Are you happy that he did this for you? There is a word that makes a difference to our text, and it is a word that much ballyhooed, it often does, but never takes us out of the understanding that Jesus is the only way to God by faith in what he has done. Now that word is by... Or as the ESV, which I read, says in the Spirit. One is by the Spirit, which most texts, by the way, use. Most translations declare that Jesus was made alive by the Spirit, not in the Spirit. It makes a difference in understanding. So in the King James Version, I want you to read it because it's going to be uh, extremely important in the next, uh, or the last message, or the next message, excuse me. In 1 Peter 3, 18 through 19, in the King James Version, it says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Suffered for our sins. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. I will use this another time. Next week, especially. And we must know that God has a purpose for everything. God knew before the foundation of the world that he was going to have to send his son to die for us. Before he made you and before he made me, he knew we would be sinners and they had need of a savior. The understanding for us is that God raised his own son from the dead and if he did that for his own son, he will do it for us as long as we believe on the son, Jesus Christ. We live in a world today that is torn, torn apart. And not only is the world, is America torn apart by this and that and this and that and, and uh, Democrat, Republican, dumb and dumber. You know, it all goes to, to saying that we are torn, but so is the churches. Some of them want to tell you that there's ways that you can do something to get to heaven. But my friends, there's not. There's only one way to heaven, and that is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The written word is there for us to look at, and is there for us at all times. We should take no other word than the word written down for us. We are sinners. We are all sinners and have need of a Savior. Romans 3 tells us that, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He didn't say just a few. He didn't say anything else but all are sinners. That includes us. We are sinners. Yet the key is we have been saved through our faith in Jesus Christ. God's design will always go forth. God sent his son in love to die as a man to give us his blood so that we might have a clean heart. We might have the clean heart through the sacrifice of his son. 
And as we know, he sent Jesus into the world, and this is the only time in world in the world that God could really get his son to do what he needed to do. Because you see, God knew, God knows the beginning from the end. He's omniscient. He already knew before the foundation of the world that he would have to send his son into the world to die for the world. He also knew exactly what time, what time in history that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were so depraved that they would put his son on the cross. And also, he knew the Romans would be in charge and they brought with them some old customs of of crucifixion. And so God sent his son into the world at just the right time so that you and I could be saved. He sent his son as a love offering, as a gift, we will find out. God sees the beginning from the end. And we know that God understood that all this was going to go on. And so right away in Genesis, we find that uh, Christ was going to bruise, or not bruise, but was going to beat the head of Satan in victory. Satan could only bruise the heel of Christ. Satan put him on the cross. But victory was won because he didn't stay in that tomb. He's alive today, sitting at the right hand of the Father. I think it's glorious that God is omniscient, and yet at the same time it it kind of bothers me on occasion because he knows my very thoughts. He knows every thought I'm going to have between now and the time I die, between the time I was born and, and now. He has known every thought before the foundation of the world. That's amazing to me. It is. But, but he's God. You see, that's why we must understand that God is such a, a huge presence in everybody's life. When you drive down the road, he's right there with you because he's in you. He lives within you through the Holy Spirit. He lives within you through his son, Jesus Christ. He knows your every thought, your every deed, everything that you've ever done. And yet, he loves you. You are a child of God. We had no way to get out of our predicament of sin. Once sin entered the world, we had to be cast out of the garden. And then the bad things started to happen because this world starts to die. And there's going to come a time when it's going to be almost totally dead and God's going to bring back everybody. And all of us will be caught up to the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. You all get a new mansion. Anybody here want like a mansion? We got a new one coming. But yet that mansion is just a, a, a being of something that we just put on the side because what we really want to do is stand before Jesus Christ and thank him for everything he's done for us. But in Romans 6.23 It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I've always kind of looked at this uh, passage with an either or. If you're a sinner, you're going to hell because of the wages of sin. And those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ get to go to heaven. But if you really look at it, it's saying that all have sinned. You and I are sinners. The wages of that sin is death. We all deserve death. Justice says we need to go to hell. But Jesus Christ gives us a sweet gift. And it is a gift. And if it's a gift, can you work for a gift? Can you do something to earn a gift? You get a gift because someone loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Are there strings attached to that? There is no strings. It says God loved you so much to give you a gift. But through that gift, you will not have to suffer the wages of sin. Praise God, we are born again. I know that the wages of sin is death. And when I finally realized that, I asked God into my heart. 
I asked him to come and, and accept, that I wanted to accept that gift. And yet at the same time, we must understand that God understand, under knew exactly what was going to happen and why it was going to happen. How do I know this? Well, I can tell you in Acts 2, 23 through 24, it says, This man was handed over to you by, by what? God's set knowledge and foreknowledge. God, let me stop there a second. God determined before the foundation of the world that there was a time. He already knew exactly the time he was going to send his son into the world by his purpose, his purpose was to save you and me, and his knowledge was he knew exactly when to send his son into the world. His, by his set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, and you put your name there, you were a sinner, fall short of the glory of God, you needed rescuing, but with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Jesus is alive today. If you don't believe it, just ask me because he lives within my heart and he should be living within your heart. The just for the unjust. The perfect for the imperfect. The righteous for the unrighteous we are the ones that needed help and the only way we could do that is by having imputed unto us the blood of the perfect lamb of god we have it given to us i'm sure it wasn't with these words i made them up but i can kind of feel them in my heart as god goes to his son and you can read about it there in philippians chapter 2 if you like God went to his son and said, Son, I'm going to make man. And man's going to sin horribly. He's going to fall. And he's got no way to get out. But what he needs is perfect blood put on a perfect altar so that he can have faith to get back to the glory of heaven. Will you do it, son? And I'm sure Jesus looked at his father and he said, Yeah, Father, I'll do it for you and I'll do it for them. Now, I know it wasn't exactly those words, but when you read Philippians 2, you get that same understanding. Jesus was willing to leave heaven and die on a cruel cross. How glorious our Savior is. If you remember back at the start of this series... You will see this great passage that says it all about Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold. That's a reward. That's earning something. That you were redeemed from the empty way of life. You had an empty way of life. But you are now fulfilled by the glory of Jesus Christ was handed down to you from your forefathers. In other words, because of the garden, we all were sinners and had need of a Savior. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, a perfect sacrifice was put on a perfect altar that you and I could have eternal life, a perfect life in heaven forever. Amen. Praise God for a glorious life waiting. We have been redeemed by the perfect Lamb of God. Now to realize that it was once for all, we also need to realize that the temple of the Israelites was only a copy, it says, as he made it, make it very carefully, because it's a copy of the one that's in heaven. The temple down here was not the temple of God. It was a replica of what's in heaven. Jesus could not have put his blood on the altar down here because you see all the even though they were perfect lambs it was still tainted blood his blood wasn't mixed with anything before it was put into your heart he went through the more perfect tabernacle in heaven to place his blood 
we know in Hebrews 9, 11 through 12. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of blood and of blood of the bulls and the goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. So when God puts his heart or his blood into your heart, you gotta know it's perfect blood. Because the just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous must be fulfilled. The perfect blood of Christ has to be given for our lives. We must stand firm and contend for Jesus Christ, because we also know in Hebrews 9, 28, he's, it says, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. It doesn't say all people. Many people. Why is there only many people? We'll just leave here today and go talk to some of the people out in this world. They're lost. He gave his life for them too, but the life that works is the one that accepts Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And he will appear a second time. Not to bear sin. He did that already. But to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Are you waiting for Jesus Christ? Every day we pray, come Lord Jesus, come. That's in Revelation 22, 20. Come Lord Jesus. We got pains, we got aches, we want a new body, we want a new life. Come Lord Jesus, come. Give us the perfect way of life. Yet in our hope we stand firm because we know that heaven awaits for the redeemed. And we are the redeemed of Jesus. We find in Romans 8, 3, it says, For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man. Your sins have been condemned by the perfect Lamb of God. Aren't you happy about that? Praise God. I th thought I'd get a few more amens on that. <laughs> Jesus made your sins go away. Covered him with the blood. The law could not save. But it was there to lead us to Christ. But our imperfect ways, how many of us have kept all the commandments? Our whole life. From the moment of being born until now. I don't think there's anybody in here that wouldn't say they have at least take, uh, lost one of them in their heart. And all it takes is one sin to keep you from the glory of heaven. Jesus justified that sin, and we are justified by faith. Praise God. Now, Abraham was considered righteous by his faith, faith in God. We also know that it's talked about him in Hebrews 11.6, which I don't have there, but it just says, it says that we, uh, without faith, is it impossible to please God? Without faith. I'm talking about faith that works. I'm talking about faith that says, Jesus Christ, I love you with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my strength, and with all my soul, and I'm ready to do anything you want me to do. You got that kind of faith? That's the kind of faith. God's looking for. Uh, in uh, two weeks, I'm going to be talking about Galatians 3, 26 and 27, where it says we are all sons of God through faith, and then in our baptism we are clothed with Christ. But just before then, in Galatians 3, 24 and 25, it says, So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by what? Come on. By what? Faith. Now that faith has come, 
We are no longer under the supervision of the law. So therefore, there isn't anything we can do except have faith in Jesus Christ. Now, from that faith, according to Romans 1.5 and also, I think it's 12.21, it says, to the obedience that comes from faith. You've got to have faith first, and then you obey. So as the ladies come to, to lead us in a time of decision, I want to add one more verse to our many today. We must stop pounding any pulpit in the United States, anywhere in the world, that says, you got to do this, this, and this, and this to be saved. Because, my friends, there's nothing you can do except believe that Jesus Christ bought your life on that altar in heaven. Now, you do a little plenty, and you need to obey. That's the part of submission unto Jesus Christ. You come to him, and you confess, repent, and are immersed. You do all those things because you have faith. And we find in 2 Corinthians 5, 21... It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What a wonderful passage. God made his son as sinful man. He made